Right. And we're we're recording. Hopefully, I'll cool. try and figure out how to share it after this. <laughs> All right. Cool. Hi everyone. My name is Beetle. Uh, my yes. pronouns are they, he. Uh, either is fine. And so just as an introduction, um, I want to know your guys' names. Uh, actually, I know everyone here, but just introduce yourselves to each other, uh, your pronouns, and what your experience with tabletop role-playing games is. So we can, let's say, let's start with Carps and Pet. Hi, um, I'm Squire Pet. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Um, so my experience with uh, tabletop gaming uh, came in high school. I had a, a group of high school friends that I knew from uh, the, the unofficial gaming room at our school. We played magic and they kept inviting me to play D&D &D and I eventually went under the, uh, initially under the um, deal that you wouldn't tell anybody that I was playing D&D &D with you guys. Um, and I've been really playing ever since. Um, uh, it, it's difficult uh, to, to do it regularly as a, an adult, um, but I did find a, a group um, where people can jump in and jump out pretty regularly um, without changing the, um, uh, ignoring all continuity errors of people jumping in and out. Um, and that's been really fun. Nice. Meeting chips. <laughs> all right, sorry. Um, hi, I'm Carps. Um, so what got me, I'm going to answer the question as quick as possible, but kind of like in more of a larger general answer. What's gotten me into fantasy role playing is Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance 2 <laughs> on the PS2. Um, and I remember as a kid, I put so many hours back. And I hate to sound super nostalgic or whatever, but when I'd have to like push my couch closer to my TV so me and my buddies can cable up and play together, right? Well, that, that one kind of created a downward spiral into like fantasy RPG in general. Um, and in Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance 2, uh, when you beat the game, you can play as Dritz, which is cool, um, which is a, a Forgotten Realms character. Um, so, D&D. Um, so, in high school, none of my friends played D&D, but we were all kind of generally nerdy kind of people. Um, so, for my, I think it was the 17th birthday, I told everybody, hey, I don't want to party or, any, or, like, you know, I don't want us to, like, make a deal or anything. I, I'd really like for all of us to play D&D. So, we went and we bought some dice and I bought one of the, the books and as much resources as possible and started DMing for my group. I played for like, you know, like a year, two years. Um, but, but honestly, um, Belagarth satisfies a lot of my fantasy RPG. Um, so I put a lot of time into that, but I do drop in every once in a while on the D&D um, &D meetup that uh, Pet here was talking about. I really enjoy it. So that's my experience with it. Cool. We played fourth edition in high school too, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, and then let's go over to House, if you want to introduce yourself. Hi, I am House. Um, my my mundane name is Paul, if you, if you guys like to call me that too. Um, so, yeah, for... Uh, so, Bellagarth got me into uh, tabletop RPGs. Um, some of you may know Rift and Brian, uh, Anna's husband, they got me into D and D. We started with fourth edition, and if you ask a lot of people about that, they're like, "Why the fuck did?" I'm sorry, I why did you start with fourth edition? Everyone's like, 3.5 was better." Blah blah blah. Whatever. Because um, I started with fourth, I didn't know 3.5 was like the holy grail or whatever. I had a great time with fourth. To me, it felt like the tabletop version of Dragon Age, uh, so that was fun. Um, after that, I played a little bit of Shadowrun, and that was fun. Uh, a lot of D6s involved. I really like that universe. It is fun. But I can't find too many people to play it. Um, then I did Pathfinder. That was five years ago. Um, a friend of mine was running... Uh, it, it wasn't a homebrew campaign. They were running a module. Which is what I'm doing now. Um, and then I did a little bit of D&D &D, 
5th edition, which is the current one. And right now, I am a player in a Star Wars RPG, and I am running a Pathfinder 1st edition campaign. Nice. Got my little chainmail dice bag. Nice. <laughs> my dice bag is sitting just off screen, though, too. Nice. Um, and then Anne and Mike, if you want to introduce yourselves. <laughs> so my first experience with Dungeons and Dragons was helping my brother over 40 years ago. I would roll the dice as he created his uh, dungeons. And then uh, I never got to play because I was just a little kid and um, was in reintroduced to it uh, few years ago when our favorite son began playing. Uh, that's, that's, that's what I got introduced to. I, uh, I never uh, was exposed to it as a kid, but uh, I always uh, would walk past Eric's room when he was, uh, or Beetle, I should say, <laughs> um, his room, and he, he was just always loud and yelling and, and doing all this stuff, and it was always so much fun <laughs> to hear, and I, I really kind of appreciated the creativity of the storytelling and the, the world building and all that kind of stuff. So it was, so um, I, I, yeah, actually we, we get both involved with improv uh, comedy and, and this is kind of like improv fiction. So um, I just, I just thought it was kind of interesting, especially the storytelling and the creative effect and uh, just wanted to hear kind of what, what, what was thought about how to create good stories in this in this these worlds so awesome so yeah sounds like you all have at least some knowledge or background experience in tabletop role playing games uh, a little bit about my experience i have been playing dungeons and dragons specifically for about four years um, i have about eight years of improv experience before that. Um, but yeah, a lot of like theater and all of that in my background um, and just making characters in general. So a little bit about this class, we have a few different topics that I'm gonna cover, but if you guys have any questions or things you wanna add about things that have worked in your experience with playing TTRPGs, uh, just that's just shortened tabletop role playing games if, you're unfamiliar. Um, but yeah, feel free to ask me about anything that I'm saying or add anything that you want to say, uh, either in the chat or just turn on your mic. So um, one of the first things that I like to emphasize when I teach about uh, Dungeons and Dragons tabletop role playing games is like, remember the goal of what tabletop role playing games are. And like for me personally, what I really like getting out of it is I get to tell a fun story with my friends. Um, I get to embody these fun characters and do all this sorts of different goofy stuff. Um, and sometimes it's serious and sometimes we have great stories to tell. Sometimes we're all just being goofy together and we're also pretending we're dragons or something. Um, but overall, I think what it really comes down to is you're all there to tell a story with your friends and have fun doing that. Um, and so that brings us to this kind of idea of how do we create that good group storytelling environment? And this is one of the main gists of the class today. Um, but we want to make sure that one, people feel comfortable participating in these different environments. Um, one second, someone's trying to get in. Um, it says, uh, Carps and Pet, maybe you could take a look at this. Someone tried to join, but it says asking him for a password. I'm going to say to just try to, um, so one of the things that we want to make sure we do is, um, promote the idea that anyone can and should help participate in the story. And so overall, I mean, I know I personally have had different experiences with um, sometimes having trouble participating in different groups, and sometimes maybe I don't feel as comfortable, and these are just some ways that I've found it's helpful. So one of the first things 
that we do, or I like to do, is, there's Aaron. Hey Aaron, uh, if you could put your name and pronouns in the chat. Um, then if you wanna do a brief introduction, that's all right. Um, so when we're, one of the best things that I like to do for creating kind of this, starting out when I'm world building, those sorts of things, I like to make what I call like a rules and expectations form. So basically saying like, hey, these are some of the themes that might appear in this game. These are some things that um, one could potentially be um, something that people might have a hard time interacting with. Um, for like, for example, uh, I really dislike chalk, like the, the writing implement. So if they're making, like it, it physically makes me cringe, like talking about it or hearing descriptions of it. So if, uh, dad, don't even, <laughs> uh, he, yeah. So if someone's playing a game that's all about chalk, for example, I probably won't want to play. Um, but creating this rules and expectations form, which basically just includes all the things that will probably be in this campaign um, and just providing a space where people can answer um, what they want to see in the campaign and what they really don't want to see in the campaign. So like if I was answering on a rules and expectations form, I would probably say, I don't want to see chalk. I never want this to be a main topic of conversation. And if someone else has a problem with chalk, like let me know and I'll stop talking about it. But um, yeah, chalk for me is a no. Um, but yeah, just provide that space where people can uh, ideally anonymously put like, hey, I'd really like if this wasn't a thing that came up in the game. And then look through those um, responses. And then before you start playing, just make sure everyone is on the same page about what's allowed and what's not. Um, yeah. So like another one example of one that I made was uh, we were setting up, we're still in the process of setting up a game where we're all playing as mechs and we're like fighter pilots. And so one thing that a bunch of people really wanted to see was like big anime style super moves. So those are definitely something that I want to incorporate in the world building of that. And so, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to stop me at any point about how to make those. Yeah, Pat. Um, so, uh, the experience between um, sort of your typical D and D um, member, and le let's be real, it's usually uh, dudes. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely experience uh, experiences the game differently than um, somebody like me, a woman or um, a person of color, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, oftentimes people just don't know what they don't know. And um, I know that I've had plenty of experiences in which like what's being talked about is cringe. And uh, you know, I, I, I'll text the DM under the table and be like, uh, can we move on from this? Um, but I, I, I love your idea of doing that beforehand. Yeah. And and what you're saying actually brings up a good point, which is one that I have a little bit later in my notes, but um, another thing that you can implement to kind of reinforce this idea of like making sure everyone's comfortable feeling, adding to this environment and being there, um, it's, it's what's called an X card in a lot of games. Um, so like this would probably be a bit harder to do now because everything's online, but a lot of people will have like a note card in the middle of their table that just has like an X on it or um, some variations of that. Uh, I'll explain what it is before I go into variations. But basically, if anyone like touches it, 
during play whenever like as soon as that happens like no questions asked this scene like fades to black or wraps up very quickly and you move on from whatever topic it is and if that person wants to elaborate like hey i was uncomfortable when this happened can we avoid this in the future like they're free to do that themselves but by no means will they have to provide an explanation for what it is that it, it seems like you could do that with the reactions button. Um, you can do things like, you know, that or, you know, I don't know, I don't know, like that or whatever, mm -hmm. or even with the chat. Um, yeah. So mm -hmm. it seems like you could do that. Yeah. So you can definitely do that online. You just have to figure out some ways around it. Like my dad said, like, you can just add, have it like a certain reaction means this one thing and then different reaction means something else. But yeah. Um, just kind of trying to include like the ability to one like update your answers um, during the game as well, I think is a great thing to add. Um, yeah, so moving on to that next topic, uh, one of them, one of the things I also wanted to talk about is communicating theme beforehand uh, of what the different games that you're going to play is. So. For example, like a lot of Dungeons and Dragons are fantasy games, but is it going to be more, uh, well, I guess it's a tone, but tonally, is it going to be more serious? Is it going to be more comedic? Um, and overall, just having everyone be on the same page about what tone it is, I think can generally help in storytelling because, um, Maybe you have one person that wants to play in a comedic game versus someone who wants to be very like dark, gritty, serious themes. And if we've all built our characters to fit the world that we wanted it to be rather than what we're all deciding that it is together, because ultimately that is what tabletop role playing games are, is you're telling a story together and everyone's adding their part to it. Um, it can cause some tension and it can cause some difficulty continuing the story if we have different themes in mind or what the story is. Um, so that's one of the things that I also like to communicate beforehand. Um, yeah, and even more so like um, communicating about various aspects of the game throughout when you're, uh, when you're actually playing is um, one, one thing that I've um, experienced in the past is like sometimes like burnout from playing D and D is a real thing. Like it's hard to continue. I keep saying D and D, but all tabletop role playing games. Uh, sometimes your characters are going to fall out of the story. Sometimes you yourself, are going to have a bit more of a problem continuing to add to the story. Cause it's like, I don't really see how my character is fitting in with the rest of the group anymore. And so one thing that um, dungeon masters I've had in the past have done have been like, they've checked in, like they've asked some questions of the players, like, Hey, how are you feeling about everything? Um, I want to give a shout out to Aaron who's in the chat right now. He he's very good about, um, like talking to people and communicating like, Hey, what is, um, what, how are you feeling about everything? What do you think your character is thinking about everything? And overall, <laughs> you're welcome, Aaron. Um, so one of the things that Aaron and I actually did was in a campaign that he's running right now, I was having a bit of a hard time seeing how my character fit in and everything. And by no means was it Aaron's fault, was it? It was just me personally, I was having a hard time with my character. And so we actually organized a meeting where we talked about where we saw the character going and we ended up, it was, um, Aaron, feel free to correct me if I am getting this exact story wrong, but like my character was having some issues with, uh, I was playing a human fighter, which if you follow any of the tabletop role-playing games, memes, 
Like that's the most basic thing that you could possibly do. There's no real fantasy elements to it necessarily, but I, I was in a party of like all these magic users and like my whole thing was supposed to be fighting and I wasn't even doing that very well because everyone was like slinging all these spells. And so I, I told Aaron about it and I said like, hey, I, <laughs> I don't know where I fit into this. And so we talked about it and my character ended up, we ended up playing really hard into the I'm a regular guy in a world of magic type of thing and that becomes an internal conflict in the character like in his world he was very much meant to be like the strong one the one that fights a lot and then all of a sudden he lost that and so like looking at what your characters have and what your different players have about their backstory if you can incorporate that into the story as a dm like that's great like just absolutely it makes them feel very included and like they have a role to play in the grand scheme of things um so yeah like communication during the game not just during character creation absolutely adds so much to the overall environment i would say um yeah i incorporated i talked about I have a whiteboard that I'm checking with all the different subjects on here. Um, so we talked about incorporating backstory. Incorporate backstory as much as you can. Some, some players, if you're the dungeon master, will give you more to work with. Um, they will write a much longer backstory that you can, and like the temptation is real to like, just keep pulling stuff from that one character's backstory, but at the end of the day, it's a group storytelling experience. So yeah, house. So yeah, like, I've not been big on like backstory for, for all the guys of mine. Mm -hmm. And like, uh, I, I feel like, uh, so a lot of us, we are our, our own toughest critics. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm always like second guessing myself with like everything I do with this mm -hmm. campaign. And I'm, I'm like, should I do something different? You know, like X, Y, and Z, which is why I, I didn't want to make the the campaign itself. So like, I found uh, a, a campaign online. I'm, I'm just following that. Um, and uh, but like, so like while following the, this campaign, um, like I do want to like create little arcs between, like inside of it to. to give each character its own focus at a point so that way they mm -hmm. feel like they matter more i've got the like i have five people in, in my party and um two okay one deals an absurd amount of damage um like <laughs> god damn it he, he he crit actually he's crit a couple times on on, on like on my my creatures and he deals most of their damage <laughs> It's so stupid, uh, but one of my guys doesn't do much damage, and I, I've always wondered about like how does he feel like, about his place in this. Um, but like uh, I, I think I, I should double check, but I think he's very satisfied with it. Like I, I guess I should ask them, but like they all seem like they're content, and like the, they all keep coming back week after week. <laughs> um, but yeah, like he's he's a halfling druid, and so he'll just be sitting in the back having his badger do shit, and uh, he he might cast some tangle every now and then. But he's pretty much just a utility bot for the most part. Um, although I think people's damage will plateau after a while, and we don't have like a sorcerer or anything, so that might be so that might get bad for the party later on. But we'll see if we last that long. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And some people really do enjoy just being there with their friends. Like, not everyone necessarily wants to um, do the same roles as everyone else. Like, some people do just want to sit in the back. And, like, yeah, but, like, checking in with them, I think, is a great idea. Just, like, 
making sure like, yeah, this is, are you doing all right? Is there anything you want to see more of in the campaign? Like all those sorts of things. Yeah, Pet. Um, I wanted to make a comment um, going back to what you said about um, incorporating people's uh, character background. Um, I have a, a game master friend who uses, who has like a regular group that meets, meets virtually. Um, but something that they like to do is um, bring in other people to be guest voices for um, various enemies that are in and out. And so um, he allowed me to be uh, a guest voice of some pirate lady or whatever. And, um, you know, he definitely coached me through um, somebody's particular character background and about that my character knew something that she wanted to know. And um, it was very interesting just as like a, you know, outsider to the campaign, but I would occasionally check back in um, after my character, you know, was slaughtered by the party. Um, but, you know, it, it was really cool to hear that, um, you know, this, this character background built so much of the way that um, he had the NPCs interact with the PCs that um, he said the, the final session, she was in tears. And that was one of his proudest moments as a DM um, to, to know that, that the story that they had created moved somebody to, to tears. And, and that starts with, um, you know, emphasizing the character's background and having that be a main drive of the story. Yeah, cars. I have a question on introducing backstory to uh, the world. I, I guess the general question I ask is like, it, it doesn't it seem like a debate or like, are you creating a world in which the characters, like, is it your world you're creating or is it the world of the characters that you're creating? Um, and then if you are creating a world based on the experiences of your characters, what, doesn't that get time consuming? And like, how do you balance out your creativity in comparison to, or like combined with what ideas they have without making their ideas seem like cheap character gimmicks or um, just like subtle nods? Is it good for it to be a subtle nod? I, I, I it's, yeah. Um. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, so a lot of the time, like, um, so I think what you're saying is like, you're asking about how do you contribute their creativity to the world as a whole? Or how do you, yeah. I guess my question is, uh, do you as a DM have to make like the decision of, the characters are only getting X amount of time or, or, or involvement in the world. Uh, is this your world or is this the character's world? Because if it's entirely the character's world, doesn't that stifle your creativity as a DM? Mm -hmm. uh, are there ways that you avoid that, that you could maybe share with us? Um, yeah, so what I would say overall is, I like to think of it as it's everyone who's playing's world. And there are different parts that like, their characters had never interacted with before the world, like the game started and everything. And there are things that happen that are specifically part of their world. And so like we can have, it's what I like to do is sometimes my players will give me a, uh, let's say they give me some kind of rival that they had in their like backstory or their campaign if I can somehow tie that rival into like, say there's a big villain organization in my game, if I can somehow incorporate it as like they, that rival is part of this villain organization, then we have kind of a meshing of this character from their world feels very a part of the world as a whole while 
we're not just focusing on this one particular character's backstory too much. So like try to incorporate what they give you into the whole thing. Yeah. Hello. Um, are you just renaming characters at that point? Or like, um, um, what was the that you do by making them their characters? How mm -hmm. much information are you getting from your players? Um, I, I mean, it depends. Uh, some players will give you a much longer backstory. One of my friends has written a 20 page backstory for multiple campaigns, um, like for completely different characters, like, yeah, um, so some people do give you a lot and that it is a bit difficult to work with when someone gives you as much as 20 pages of backstory and one person gives you um, like maybe a paragraph or two. Um, so it there is a lot of temptation to just be like, oh man, this is so cool. I wanna incorporate this from their story and this from their story and this from their story. Um, but a lot of the time it's like, if you keep doing that, then one person starts to feel kind of like the main character and people are on the outside of that kind of feel more excluded. So like what I try to do is if there's something from someone who gives me like a smaller amount of backstory, or even if they give me a big amount of backstory, I like to, I like to ask questions, like clarifying questions about that character's background and backstory um, that are like, so you mentioned that you grew up in the family with your parents and you had seven siblings. Like what was your relationship with your parents if you had this many siblings? <laughs> um, like how many, what, what siblings were you closest with? How did being part of such a big family affect you like all those sorts of things. So like in the position of being the DM or GM in whatever game you're playing, um, I think it can only benefit you to be involved in kind of extracting what there is to work with in the, in the backstory. Yeah, go ahead, Carbs. Just a, to, for what I gathered from what you said, so you're saying it's a, the DM's responsibility to edit through maybe an abundance of backstory from some people, but then also kind of ask questions to fill in the blanks from other people. Yeah. Cool. And then kind of like maybe you incorporate like, like sometimes you, it's unavoidable to somehow have the person who like gave you a ton of backstory to incorporate more stuff from it. Like, that's probably going to happen if you have so much more to work with. But like, it's also important to make sure that the people who don't give you as much still have stuff represented from their thing because their characters are equally a part of this world. Nice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, do we have any other questions? What is on my agenda? Yeah, so this brings me nicely into my next topic, which is um, yes and and yes anding as a DM. So if, are any of you familiar with what yes anding is? I know Ann yes. and Mike are. Good, um, I heard that so much uh, when I was doing improv in high school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the, the guy that we had as, as like uh, uh, the coach for our school, uh, he actually had that tattooed on his arm. Uh, so, yeah. Nice. Um, yeah. So, yes, ending a little bit about it is just, since most of you seem familiar, is it's about taking what the people in the scene and scene being the game in this context, taking what they give you and building on it. So, it doesn't necessarily mean there's not going to be player to player conflict. And in a lot of cases, like character to character conflict, like from a story perspective can create some awesome stories. 
but it's important to know when it's character to character conflict versus negating another person's choice as a character. Because um, um, I kind of have a complicated relationship with the phrase yes and, because it makes it sound like you have to agree with everything that's going on, but you can also make it a no but, if that makes sense. Like, I disagree with you, but I acknowledge that you said it and it's now a part of our story and it's a part of the world that we live in when the characters add something to their story. Yeah. Um, can I ask for a uh, specific example mm -hmm. of that? Because both Carps and I are, are unfamiliar with uh, the yes and concept. Oh. Yeah, sorry. Um, so I'll clarify a bit about what yes anding is. So yes and is a, one of the key principles of improv comedy or improv anything. Um, it's basically um, don't say if someone says, hi, honey, I'm back from the grocery store. Um, it's accepting that that's a thing that happened and not saying, no, you didn't come back from the grocery store. You were in, you were at school. So like it's avoiding doing things like that. So that's a more basic example, but um, so don't negate other people's choices. Everything that someone says in the game is something that's been said in the world of this game. Like you can't, as much as you can't um, take back something someone else said in the real world, you can't do it in the world of the story. Uh, Mike, you had a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to add a little bit to it. So there's mm -hmm. the yes part and the and part. Mm -hmm. Yes is agreeing that that whatever that person said just really happened. Mm -hmm. That's the yes, I agree. Yes, that happened. The and part is always adding something more. So it's like, um, you know, he says he went to the grocery store and we said, yes, was they, were they still cleaning up the murder scene? You know, or something like that. So it's like, there's yes, and you added something more. Now the scene can go further because you've just added added something to it. Now he can answer, yes, um, I got blood all over myself, right? So, so it's, it's, it's kind of just always taking, yes, that happened and going further. Yeah. Mike is a technician at an improv theater. <laughs> so he sees a lot of improv. Um, but yeah, thank you for adding the and part because I didn't totally specify that, but it's, yeah, it's taking what has been said and agreeing that it happened and building on that either with your reactions, um, like as a player, like if someone attacks you, you're probably going to have a response to that. So like in the world of Dungeons and Dragons. So you, your and in that case is your response to being attacked. Um, but that's not to say that you can't do a no but. So for the example of, I was just at the grocery store, um, an example of like a no but potentially could be like, what, you were at the grocery store? How many times have I told you not to go back there? You know what happened last time. And then that gives someone some more to work with, with um, building on that afterwards because it's a constant give and take with your scene partners about what is going on and what's um, and what you're building on. And so, yeah, Pet. Thank you for um, clarifying. Um, so I, I haven't heard it that way. Um, so th thank you for, for clarifying. Um, but I have seen on various like websites that um, give advice to people who are considering DMing. Um, sound, sound something similar, which is like, if somebody asks, does the, does the bar have a fireplace um, that as a DM, um, if it doesn't like break the story, that, you know, go ahead and just say yes, it does. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that, that kind of brings me into my next point, which, um, so yes, anding and improv 
can be a bit easier because everyone has just as much influence on what's in the world of this scene. Whereas as a DM, you do have that ultimate say of this thing is here or this thing is not here. Um, and so it can be a bit more of a difficult balance figuring out like, like you said, like if it doesn't break anything, like having a fireplace there, sure. Um, if it's like something that's going to be the fireplace um, is a key part of your detective mystery, the fact that it's not there, like then no, there's not a fireplace because you ultimately get to say like what is there and isn't there. And so yes anding as a DM also um, can extend to your players plans and how they want to do things. Um, like for example, if your character wants, and, and the dice also have a bit of a say in that, um, in what exactly you can and can't do. Um, so like if I said that I was going to go walk outside my house right now and lift my car over my head, like I couldn't do that. So like the DM is ultimately the one that says that plan isn't going to work. Like, but as the dungeon master or game master, you do have a unique opportunity to be like, to potentially suggest alternatives to like, no, you can't just go out and lift your car over your head. But if you grab a bunch of other people, then maybe you can flip over this car. Um, so like determining like what's a multi-person job, what's, what's capable by yourself, what other avenues you might want to try that could achieve a similar result, but like obviously keep the balance of the players have autonomy and like can do their own plans. Uh, and this, like, it also extends to um, house rules. Um, like, for, for those of you who don't know, um, house rules are rules that aren't explicitly in the rules as written in the book, but you in your, like, group of players can just decide, like, this is the way we want to interpret this spell. It works like this. Um, so I think that's a great way to add to the storytelling environment, if particularly in combat for tabletop role-playing games, because it can get kind of dry sometimes through just regular, um, like, I attack, I attack, I attack, if you want to say. And like, most of us here uh, are in Belagarth. I'm sure we know plenty of moves with different names. Like, I throw a dark side on him. I do a reverse rap. Um, and so like adding those different things, like even when you're in combat, you can add these different aspects of, it feels like we're telling a story despite everything that we're doing right now be determinate uh, upon um, rolling dice and does it hit or not? <laughs> yeah, House. Uh, so for like the way I do my combat, it's mostly pretty bare bones except mm -hmm. for when someone's doing the like killing blow on a creature yeah. or like, on the main boss, but like, so I haven't watched all. Okay, also, I know to not compare myself to Matt Mercer. <laughs> when you watch Critical Role, it's hard yeah. to like not. I, and, I figured uh, this topic would come up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and uh, got the the oh, God. <laughs> so like, whenever they like they do combat like. Matt's like describing like what they do. I'm like, damn, just, <laughs> damn, yeah. Uh, also, yeah. Uh, Matt has like a little playlist of tips for uh, GMs. Oh, nice. It, 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 uh, that that helped me out. Nice. If you want to link that in the chat, I'm sure some people would appreciate it, or we can find it on our own. If you want to include it on your own, that's cool. Um, yeah, that's uh, carps. Can I share a funny house rule that I had to make for a character? Absolutely, please do. So I had a, uh, in high school I had a buddy and we, he disagreed, I don't know, we, I mean honestly it was a ragtag group and it was the first time we all played so we could have been, inter I could have been interpreting the, uh, the, the carry weight rules maybe incorrectly, I don't know. 
But yeah. one of my players really disagreed with it. And he's like, no, he's super convinced that he could carry more on his back, like, regularly. Um, so I told – it became more of a thing with the group because it was, like, a back and forth. And I was like, all right, well, you know, we're human beings. We can, like, put some numbers to what we can actually do. And I said, all right, well, I weigh, you know, 140 pounds or whatever. If you can carry me on your back and run X amount, sure, dude, show it. So, yeah, in, we went in my front yard, and it was like a, a cul-de-sac. And I, I told him that uh, well, we agreed that he had to carry me on my, my, his back and sprint across the cul-de-sac, and he did it. And I changed the, the, the carry capacity rules. Um, it became such, such you know, like a thing for the group that it was a really fun house rule that we changed. Oh, that's <laughs> hey, so <laughs> That's pretty interesting. I hadn't heard of that before. Uh, during you know this pandemic, I'll have my guys carry me on their back and have them you know not die. Uh, I, also, I weigh like three hundred and forty pounds, just so everyone knows. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've I've never heard of um, actual like physical carrying capacity play a role in how much your character could. That's an interesting rule. I, I enjoyed that story. <laughs> um, yeah, so kind of going back to what House said about um, Matt Mercer and doing that, because it's an important point. Um, you know, he is, he is a professional. Like, this is definitely part of his job weekly is making this podcast. So, like, absolutely. Like, your game is your own. Like all of the tips that I'm saying here in this class, like feel free to take them or not take them. Like these are just things that I enjoy in my experience um, and things that I like. If you wanna, if your characters are more inclined to do like very intense combat, more like war gaming type of thing with less emphasis on story, that's absolutely okay. If you wanna, maybe not have combat play as huge of a part. Um, absolutely. Like, I'm in a game right now, we don't have combat every session, maybe not even every other session. Um, but we still have, I think last, our last um, our session, I think we were all gearing up to make a decision that we didn't even make in that campaign or in that session. Um, and we spent like several hours like all talking everything through but we told a great story because there were so many different like aspects to it. Um, like my character was possessed by a God. Yeah. Aaron's the DM. He knows exactly what I'm talking about. I was possessed by a God that like wanted me to unleash him from a gem or something. And then all of a sudden my character realized this guy's true motivation was that he was afraid of the world. And we had like a heart to heart, like within my mind, and all of a sudden we reach a new understanding of each other. And like, it was this whole thing. And it, the, like the scene itself probably was over the course of like 20 minutes, but it took us like two hours to get to this point. Um, but yeah, absolutely. D and D and tabletop role-playing games or whatever you guys want to make of it as a group. And so like the, the important thing is to not gatekeep the fun of it because like um matt mercer is very good at his job he's good at telling a story in the way that he tells a story but yeah house what did you want to say uh, it's not just him like like they're all professional voice actors yeah like, absolutely that's another like, important I mean, point yeah like i uh, so one of my very dear friends mm -hmm. uh he and and his groups uh like they they all do like different voices for the characters and stuff i don't do that yeah. um <laughs> and like I, I, i've often wondered i'm like should i be doing this <laughs> or should i just do my like normal fucking voice um but yeah um yeah like when you watch something it's very easy to like compare like yours to them Mm -hmm. but it's important not to <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely but absolutely take inspiration like, mm -hmm. got, like i watched uh, like also there is so much material for critical yeah. role <laughs> it would take so long to watch all of it oh absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. i'm excited for for when they 
do the cartoon and I'll just mm -hmm. watch that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but like I watched a little bit, like I'll catch highlights here and there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'm like, I'll see this or that. I'm like, oh, maybe I'll do this differently. But I know I'm not that Mercer. Yeah. God, uh, obviously we're not playing in person right now, but their table and everything on there, oh my. <laughs> yeah another nice. another great set design um uh what's it called podcast not podcast uh dungeons and dragons campaign is uh dimension 20 if you ever heard of it it's a bunch of the people from college humor or the people that used to be on college humor they have incredible sets like they have like all of these different like they have a cave with a fog machine and like also everyone, this was an interesting campaign because everyone was food. Um, everyone was playing as like a certain type of food uh, in, as a candy in most cases. And like they have like these floating popsicles that went across the, the stage and everything. And they had a fog machine running under it and like awesome, like custom made minis. Um, but yeah, that's just a cool one if you guys want to check it out. They also do a great job of storytelling. They're all, they are professional actors. They're all professional actors. Like several of them studied that for years. And yeah, so the fun that you have in Dungeons and Dragons is your own. Like that's the important thing. The goal is tell a story with your friends. And if you're enjoying doing that, like awesome. Um, going back to the voices thing, I personally enjoy doing voices. I like doing all sorts of different stuff. But if you don't want to, that's fine. Um, I also, like even some of my tips for like doing different voices is even if you don't, like character differentiation doesn't have to happen with like terribly different voices, you know? Because like I can, I can do something that's in my normal voice. I can lower it a little bit and all of a sudden this is a bit, this is a different character. Um, I once played a, a teenage vampire girl in a campaign and we, the voice was a big part of that one just cause seeing me talk like a teenage girl was. Her voice was a bit like this. It was more um, higher up and she had a bit of a Transylvanian accent. Her name was Aurora. <laughs> Erin, you might remember this voice. It was kind of fun. <laughs> Um, but yeah, and then just like the differentiation between my normal register and that added to the kind of comedy of this game. Um, so voices can definitely add to it, but it's not like a, like a, I miss Aurora. I do too. Um, uh, so voices are not like a gatekeeping thing. Like this must be in the game. Like do what you like. Have fun. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think what else do we have on the agenda? Uh, we have 20 minutes. I have two more topics that I want to get to, but those are a bit more minor. <laughs> um, so last point I'm going to make for creating a good group storytelling environment is work with the people at your table. And this kind of builds on the yes and topic. Um, it's, it's not, we want character to character conflict, not player to player conflict. So like separating it as we're all players telling a story and our characters may not agree, but it's not like Eric and Aaron fighting each other in that sense. So we want to take the yes and, take the no but, and you know, you can have great stories that you can tell with characters that have conflicting goals. Like one of, one of my favorite campaigns, it was run by uh, our buddy Grimble from, from practice. He created a campaign where we, um, Grimbold is John for you, Aaron. Um, he 
gave everyone like a secret at the beginning of the campaign. So like secrets are another great way to like incorporate character backstory. Like here's something you know that no one else knows and you can pull it out whenever you want. Um, so my goal was I was trying to find this weapon from the Resticon temple, which was an order of monks who were supposed to be very secretive. And so we all introduce ourselves to the to the party. And I was a tiefling rogue. I was very like criminal organization type of guy. And I meet our monk friend who was played by Keg or Claudia. Um, and she's like, hi, I'm Talia. I'm from the Resicon temple. And I was like, oh, hang on. <laughs> and so it became this big thing where my character was trying to like sneak his way into becoming good friends with this monk so that he could eventually steal this weapon. And she ended up being the weapon. And then that ended up being like a whole huge thing where it's like, oh man, I kind of actually became friends with this person and now I need to turn her over to my employer. And it's like, that creates a great internal conflict but it was based on us having conflicting stories as characters. So like player versus player can be very difficult. Um, and especially with newer players, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for if people don't have as much experience playing into the more heavily story-based things, but you can get some great stories out of that with working with the people at your table, not against the players. So while, while Eric was working against Claudia's ideals, it was through the characters that this made sense and everything. Um, so yeah, base your decisions as in the characters. It's the basic part of that. <laughs> Took a while to get there. Oh, hello, cat. <laughs> um, yeah, so a little bit about character building. Um, we have only a little bit left, so I'll try to go through a bit more making characters from a storytelling and not just mechanical perspective. Um, one way that I like to do it is think of them as real people. They have a life that they lived before the game started. They'll have a life that they'll live after the game ends. Um, like, we all have different experiences. House, were you trying to say something? Uh, I was just being silly to, to, to myself. Like, uh, <laughs> you had said uh, they'll have experiences uh, after the game, and so uh, I was just saying, like, unless they die. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I forgot to add that part. Def definitely characters can and will die in your Dungeons and Dragons games. <laughs> yeah, uh, I didn't realize it when I was picking out my, um, like, I am poor at uh, planning, which is bad. That's a big quality you have as a GM. Um, and uh, uh, I, I, I started my, cam my campaign because I wanted to uh, distract my buddy from his grandma dying to COVID. Mm. And so we were like, yeah, we're going to start on this day. I'm like, I need to find a campaign. So I went with the first one I found, mm -hmm. which I told a friend of mine about it. And he does a lot of campaigns. And he he's like, that one uh, is known to have the most or has the highest rate of uh, total party wipes. I'm like, oh, great. And three of my guys are like, this is their first tabletop. So I'm like, oh, great. Uh, they're not prepared and uh, they might die. So, mm. yeah. Fun stuff. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's definitely something that plays an effect. If you're if you're going for a more character based perspective and like storytelling, that definitely like upping the danger can have a huge impact on the story and like the way that the players go about doing things and like having consequences is a great way to help tell the story. Um, it seems like that might not have been what you were going for initially, but Hopefully it's going well. So right now it's funny, like uh, this was meant for four people and I have five mm -hmm. and one of them just does an absurd amount of damage. 
And yeah, I think I need to scale things to make things harder. <laughs> um, because I, I don't think things are a challenge for them. Like most of my, like, most of the bad guys get one, maybe two turns. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Uh, until Victor comes in and deals like 40 damage. But, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, they're level four right now. Mm hmm. And at the next level, he'll be able to crit on a 15. <laughs> and yeah, because uh, he's using a scimitar and he'll, and he'll be able to make it keen. Uh, and it's normal crit range is 18, 19, 20, but this will make it 15 through 20. And uh, his, yeah, the way his character is set up, um, he delivers a spell through his sword and, and then that level scales with yeah, that damage scales with level. Um, so he'll be doing, yeah, he'll be doing 5d6 for the spell, another d6 for the sword, and then he'll have this one feat that, that does his dex damage, or his dex modifier as damage. So before crit, it's 6d6 plus 5. One crit, it's 12d6 plus 10. That's 25% of the time. Yeah, uh, I need to add more HP to stuff, I think. Yeah. And I mean, that's definitely one of the tools you can have in your GM rulebook and everything is like, the players aren't going to know if you change something. <laughs> the story that comes on the day of the game is the story that they'll remember and the story that they'll, um, that they'll take with them. And like one of the, one of, one of my favorite moments from that, um, I didn't realize it was one of my favorite moments until the campaign was already over. But from that campaign where I was working against my friend Claudia, um, our friend John had put this farm on the map of the world that he, um, that was like the big map of the world and everything that we could see. And he also had like this row of shops that were in the big city marketplace. And so we went, we went to this shop, like maybe once we went to two stores in it or something, but we spent almost an entire session hanging out on this strawberry farm where we picked a bunch of strawberries and like hung out and talked about our next plan of action. And we didn't know this until months later, but apparently John had created like detailed descriptions of everything that was going to be in these shops. He had like the characters all ready for them and the farm he didn't even have anything prepared for. So <laughs> absolutely like you can have these different like switcheroo type of things where the players are never going to know unless you tell them if you change something. Um, so that's definitely an invaluable. I hate the word invaluable. Um, it's a it's a valuable tool for um, your GMs and DMs. Yeah, Carps. I uh, GM'd a Force and Destiny campaign with a couple of my friends a couple years ago. And uh, I didn't realize this before, but if you're in a setting like space and you give them a spaceship, you pretty much can't plan where they want to go sometimes. So that happened to me and I had to basically create a new thing on a planet that was completely different than what the story was. <laughs> Yeah. Hard to do I, I do not like the Force and Destiny system. Uh, it bugs the <laughs> shit out of me after playing Pathfinder for so long. Um, but that's a whole other thing. Yeah. You know, one of the one of the other tricks you can do with the switcheroo type of deal, uh, for if you hate when your players are going somewhere that you can that you're not expecting or anything, you can switch the names of the planets. Maybe all of the different planets are the same planet, and they just have will have a different name depending on if they go there. <laughs> yeah, carbs. I, I I've had it described to me as you give them an option for two doors that lead one place. You know, yeah. maybe it, it just goes to a. Yeah. Um. Yeah. But but yeah, I agree. That's a super neat way to do it. Mm -hmm. And then with the two doors, maybe you can make it like one is supposed to lead to certain death and the other is like fine and they'll always go to the fine one but then it's like they go through this huge puzzle of like trying to figure out which door they do and then that leads to some interesting stories you know <laughs> um yeah and so cool 
about character building. That's what I wanted to talk about. Um, we have, so thinking of your characters as people, they have all their different goals and all that stuff. Um, think about their circumstances, like what things they grew up with. Like I grew up eating most of my food with a knife and fork. Some people don't do that. Maybe that's, they have different things, but that's something that I'm accustomed to and that I normally do when I eat. I'll use those utensils. But, and that, like, that's a minor example, but it's definitely something that happened when I was younger that influenced what I do now. Yes, uh, I, I agree. Probably House and I uh, use tortillas more than we use corn. <laughs> Yeah, and then that absolutely plays into a part in like how you interact with like cooking and like eating around the dinner table and those toes, all those sorts of things. Um, yeah, and so thinking about when you're just building these characters, like what what do they know? What are they afraid of? Is also also an awesome question for um, when you're creating characters. What are they afraid of? Uh, what do they want, desire, those types of things, and what's keeping them from getting there? And like, if you can answer all of those questions, like that's a great, that's, that's honestly, that's probably all you need for most circumstances with uh, questions like that. And then like pressing yourself on more on those answers that you come up with. Um, and then just continuing to build on like, what are they afraid of? Why are they afraid of it? Um, when did they start being afraid of it? Um, and then uh, characters can change also is a great, great example of um, different storytelling aspects. Like my character initially in that game where I was working against Claudia, he was all for like, yeah, I'm just here to do my job. I'm going to turn in this weapon. But through the course of like actually getting to know the other character, like we took it to a place where he had this internal conflict of, do I want to be the bad guy? Like kind of Wreck-It Ralph-esque. <laughs> um, like Wreck-It Ralph's a great example of a character that changes through his circumstances and all those sorts of things. Um, and then I'll briefly touch on world building from a storytelling perspective. Uh, so we, in world building and creating the world, we have different ways that we can go about doing it. The story and the world building are not necessarily like the linked, as linked as we'd always think they are. Um, so like take Digimon and Pokemon, for example, like those I don't know how familiar all of you guys are with Digimon versus Pokemon, but oh yeah, Carps has a Magikarp tattoo right there. Um, so Digimon is the world where the monsters, I'll, I'll start with um, both of these shows or anime series and video games can kind of be summed up to kids team up with monsters to save the day from some threat. And that can pretty adequately describe a lot of what happens in both Digimon and Pokemon. But when we take a look at the world building itself, it creates a different type of story. For example, Pokemon basically take the, the role of animals in the real world. So like everyone's familiar with Pokemon, everyone knows about Pokemon, Pokemon are incorporated in different jobs around the world and everything. Whereas in because they're they've been part of the world for forever, whereas in Digimon, we have the monsters only exist in the digital world, and only a certain amount of people know what these um, monsters are and like that they exist even, and so that creates the, for the main characters, the kids, they have to create have this balancing act of I have a world in the uh, I have a world in the real world and I have a life in the digital world and sometimes they're conflicting roles sometimes they're not um, like in the first series of Digimon they had they wanted to get back but then to the real world because they were trapped in the digital world and they had to save it 
but then they would have had to leave all their friends that they made in the digital world. Um, and so that creates a different story purely based on the result of, it's purely the result of the monsters either being incorporated in the real world or not. And so that's absolutely part of the world building. Um, so taking a look at what causes things to be the way they are when you're building your world. Um, world building also involves creating the people and cultures that inhabit your world. Um, and so like maybe there's a tribe of orcs or something, or maybe there's a whole city of orcs and maybe there's a group of elves to the whole thing. What? Um, there's a whole city of elves off to the side. Maybe the orcs and elves don't like each other as they often don't in several fantasy things. Um, but like when you're world building, looking at um, things like where did this conflict start? Um, what keeps it going? Um, what are the people like in both of these different societies and those sorts of things? Um, yeah, and then add, like we were saying earlier with creating your character backstories incorporated in the plot. Um, not always, but they can. Um, like say your character has a family that they're trying to get back to somewhere else in the world. Where are they right now? Like, what are they doing? Are they looking for this person? Are they, um, are they still alive even? Are they like, what's going on with them? And these are, it can be difficult as a dungeon master to balance all of this stuff that's going on. But I mean, again, you can have some things that just have different sorts of names, depending on if the characters go right or left. Um, and those sorts of things are great to keep in mind. Um, yeah, that's pretty much everything I have. If you guys have any specific questions, feel free to ask them, or if you have a story, Carps, yeah. Well, okay, so I have a story that is also a specific question, very short story. Mm -hmm. um, with the backpack, the, the thing with the carry capacity thing, uh, part of the, I, I was thinking about it more. Part of the reason why I was cool with that was because I used a resource that I found online called, I haven't been on it for a long time. I don't even know if it still exists, but it was called the Dungeons Master. And it was like a, like a, just like a community page for people looking for information. Um, and that, that talked about like, if you take your players at your table, you could start a campaign that bases off like their real world strengths and abilities and, and incorporate those into those char your, your character, which sometimes just happens naturally with people like building stuff. I, I, mm -hmm. I mean. um, but my question is, is what resources do you use to um, further your knowledge of DMing? I mean, you know, just you, do you use, just use the resource guides? Do you use like a special website? Is there a special cheat code that we could all have to mm -hmm. be better? Um, so one of the things that I like to do a lot is I'll look at things that I already know a lot about or like things that I'm very interested in. Um, like for example, I, um, one of the things that I did when I was a kid a lot was I had very detailed adventures with like, my stuffed animals and like all these sorts of things and they had different stuff. And so one of the campaigns that I created, um, I never actually got to play it, but it was based around these people that were stuffed animals who were basically like their kid gets taken um, by the monster under the bed. And then they're like, they have to go save this person. So like, that's one example of like, kind of take what you know. Like if you're really into sci-fi, um, like what are some common examples of stories that we see in sci-fi? Uh, like an outbreak on the ship is one of them. Uh, miscommunication with alien cultures is huge. Um, like there are all sorts of different tropes and those sorts of things. Uh, thank you for reminding me that, about that because that's actually a huge point. Uh, TVtropes.com or .org maybe is another one um, that has like a ton of different 
like if you search for a genre, then they'll have like, this is what's um, common to this genre. These are the types of characters you see. These are the types of plot hooks, um, all those sorts of things. So if you're looking to do like a specific campaign, like genre, I would absolutely say, um, look into the things that you already know, like things of the same genre and like overall just the types of stories that you can tell. Cause like you can combine different tropes and all of that. Ask Reddit for advice, yes. Um, so yeah, you can absolutely combine different tropes and stuff to create all like new stories too. Like Shrek is a great example. Like he's not the typical knight in shining armor that you see, but he falls into that category. And also the monster category that you see in like fantasy um, fairy tale type of things. Like what happens when we mix two character tropes together and we have a new character. So yeah, just sorts of things like that. Like look at the genre that you want to play in. Yeah. I, I read somewhere, uh, referencing that site. In fact, I'm gonna go look at that site again because I, I haven't been on that since I was in high school. But uh, one of the articles I read on there was how somebody uh, took the movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off and they built their campaign identical to Ferris Bueller's Day Off. <laughs> and I, I think that's cool of, of how much you can do mm. creativity. Like you can take it from, from anything. It's like mm. the, the, the hero's journey is like a, a real common thing. Like yeah. you just, bam, slap, slap into your, your story, which is mm -hmm. it's really neat being able to borrow from other, because we, we don't have to worry too much about creative licensing when we create these worlds for our, our people, right? We can mm -hmm. really rip from whatever we want. Yeah. We're not profiting on it. Mm -hmm. um, so I had an idea. Um, I've played this game um, with my favorite uh, DM of all time. Um, it's called Microscope. I've never used it to actually like build a world um, to to DM, but that that's the point of the game Microscope is there's like different ages, different periods, different characters, and, and everybody takes turns contributing into this literal world building. Um, and that would be definitely a game that I would love to play with uh, you guys, Beetle, um, and House at any point. It's nice, I haven't, I haven't heard of that. I'll definitely look into it though. Uh, I'm typing it into Google right now microscope game is it called frac a fractal role-playing game of epic histories uh that sounds about right i've only huh. played it once and it was it was over virtual so i don't know like yeah. what it was but we we both kept contributing taking turns contributing to a spreadsheet nice yeah i mean that's another thing that i this is not necessarily related to storytelling specifically, but one thing that I really like to do is like non-traditional settings and that type of thing. Like if we want to play a campaign where everyone plays as bugs, like absolutely I will play in that game. There are all sorts of different things. Um, microscope sounds cool. I'll definitely look into it. Sorry, I get really distracted when I find a new tabletop role-playing game. I I have so many saved on my computer. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? So about Ferris Bueller's Day Off, uh, <laughs> it's funny. A lot of my guys haven't seen Lord of the Rings, and so I thought about just ripping off of that completely and just seeing if anyone would notice. Um, yeah. 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 I would argue that most fantasy settings that have some sort of epic item is ripping mm -hmm. off. Uh, but I think that, you know, everything's an inspiration of, of something else. Yeah. And like how many different stories do we have where people are searching for an epic item and they're so different from each other? Um, yeah. How, 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 how epic would it be if you rip the whole like monologue about the creation of the ring to your players and then you just claimed it was yours 
You, that'd be so cool, dude. I got a great story for you guys. And then just pulled with Lord of the Rings. Oh man, that sounds so fun. I'd love to play without knowing, like without knowing what Lord of the Rings was, I'd love to play a Lord of the Rings mm. d and I think that would be so yeah. cool. Yeah. And then even with the ripping off Ferris Bueller, by Anna Mike, um, they, um, like the whole thing is like, you can, it's not, ex tabletop role-playing games are not the same as video games and video games are not the same as tabletop role-playing games. Like the person who created the whole world is there and they can react to the things that the players want to do. Like, that's what I think is really cool about them is like, there's so much customization that can happen in the story. And like, maybe they, one person chooses to stay at school when Ferris Bueller has his day off. Like, what's happening to them? That's not something we saw in the movie. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, I think that's about it. Uh, um, I, it was awesome, uh, Beetle. Thank you so much for, for mm -hmm. hosting this. Uh, thanks for teaching everybody. Um, we did just uh, record it, which is neat because there are a lot of people who would love to come, but it just doesn't meet the yeah. schedule. Um, but I've been gotten thinking while we're watching, while we're doing this, uh, while you're doing it, um, is I think it'd be really reasonable for us to create like a YouTube channel or something and upload these videos on that as a platform. Yeah. Um, of course, I didn't ask your consent for that previously or like prior to the video, um, but I'll message all instructors and stuff and make sure that that's mm -hmm. totally cool. And maybe that's yeah. something to work on for next time. Yeah, I, I have the contact information of Aaron and my parents, and I can ask them if they're fine with uh, the YouTube video being posted also. Wonderful. I, I, I'm excited. All right. I'm going to actually end the recording right now. Uh, so if there's any last thing you want to say, Beetle. Um, thanks for coming. Hope you enjoyed it. We did. <laughs> uh, yeah.